Hi, my name is Danielle Campbell, and I'd like to acknowledge the Coast and Strait Salish people and their elders past and present upon whose territory we gather today. Today I'll be talking about food systems and how we can move from a global reactive system towards designing a more proactive approach. So that's the global system and then the more regional system on that side. I will then talk about the recently formed Central Kootenai Food Policy Council and the project that I did for them. Michael Pollan stated, the way we eat has changed more in the past 50 years than it has in the previous 10,000. So our ancestors gathered and hunted, hunted for food and early agriculture was a way to grow greater quantities of favored crops. Agriculture evolved to reshape our entire global landscape. Now food systems are complex. They're comprised of production, processing, marketing, distribution, food access, consumption, and waste recovery. For example, composting or grocers who donate ugly produce to soup kitchens. Our global food system flourished due to two main factors, technological advances and policy changes. The invention of the refrigerated rail car in 1879 was absolutely pivotal for the global food market. It allowed perishables to be transported further distances than they ever had previously. And as refrigeration techniques improved, so did the distance that food traveled. In the meat industry, uh, live animals no longer had to be transported and instead, um, large companies centralized slaughter and butchering facilities so that the final prepackaged meat could be shipped all ready to sell. At the turn of the 20th century, the food adulteration was rampant and that's defined as the cheapening of products um, by adding impure or inferior ingredients or removing uh, valuable ingredients. Common practices at that time included watering down milk and wine, adding sawdust to increase bakery product weight, adding copper salts to enhance the color of pickles, peas, and green beans to create the perception of quality, and adding lead, copper, and mercury salts to um, make brightly appealing candies for children. Pretty disturbing. So luckily, chemistry and microbiology advances were able to start identifying these adulterants so that they could be regulated, identified, and enforced. Deplorable meat processing facilities were exposed in Upton Sinclair's 1906 publication, The Jungle. This stimulated the formation of both the Meat Inspection Act, as well as the Pure Food and Drug Act, which later became the FDA, in the United States later that same year. Keep in mind that these reactive regulations were created for large-scale industry, and while they protected the public from poor sanitary conditions of large facilities, they didn't necessarily apply to the local butcher. A post-World War II policy framework aimed to intensify production, reduce prices, decrease labor, and increase the selection for customers. While these policies were successful at achieving their aims, um, unforeseen limitations emerged by the 1990s. Crop yields plateaued, opposition to intensive fertilizer and uh, pesticide use was growing, Health consequences included obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and many different types of cancer. And in 2004, with the mad cow disease threat, these large-scale regulations introduced a century earlier were enforced upon all. Small-scale meat producers were essentially eliminated because they couldn't afford to meet regulations. So what began as a way to protect health inadvertently fostered an increasingly monopolized global food system that threatened the sustainability of small farms. Stepping away from reactively responding to big industry and moving towards proactively designing a healthy food system rooted in democracy is central for our values to be inserted into our food system. This concept of food sovereignty ensures the health of people, communities, environments, economies, and cultural practices. We could influence how farmers and fishers are treated and valued within society, how animals are treated, what types of additives we allow in our foods, for example, restricting sodium levels in processed foods. Local and regional food systems need to be rebuilt to link cities to their rural surroundings and thereby reconnecting producers and consumers. Communities can unite to form a regional food system that collectively produce larger volumes and stimulate the economy. 
They can increase volume and food diversity, expand seasonal availability, maximize resilience, and unify political power. Three examples of Food Policy Council work might include assessing the need for farmers markets, carefully considering location and access, creating a regional food guide to connect consumers directly to producers, and coordinating emergency food agencies to address supply, waste recovery, and locations. I did my practicum in Nelson with the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council established just in December of 2016. This figure shows some of the non-governmental organizations working on food systems and agriculture in the area and does not include the agencies that work to provide food to the hungry. The council aims to unify and provide support to these, pro to these groups. They also aim to evaluate and influence policy as well as to launch or support programs. In BC's southern interior lies the Central Kootenai region. 95% of basin boundary food is imported from outside of the region, making us vulnerable to any disruptions in the global food chain, such as war, crop plagues, water shortages, or climate changes. Over the past 15 years, less land has been used for farming, despite an increased demand for locally produced food that exceeds the currently available supply. Part of the issue is that in 2011, the annual regional farming profits averaged $8,300 per year. Since the hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams were built in the 1960s and 70s in the area, the Tunaha First Nation of the area are no longer able to eat some of their traditional foods like salmon, which are no longer there, and sturgeon, which are considered endangered. Traditional hunting practices are grounded in the belief that eating food from the immediate territorial land contributes to good health. While self-sufficiency aims to eat food exclusively from within the region, for example, maybe you know about the 100-mile diet, um, food self-reliance prioritizes regional foods while still buying global foods. I personally wouldn't want to give up my mangoes. The Central Kootenai Food Policy Council discussed at their last meeting the importance of supporting both large and small scale producers while sharing knowledge and working together. It's important to note that local food isn't inherently good and global food isn't inherently bad. It's just as plausible for a farm next door to be treating animals unethically as it is in another country. Or a global food distribution example that I can think of is that one of the region's beer is shipped to a centralized distribution center in Edmonton before it has to come back to store shelves. So there's definitely um, different things that we can be working on. Since the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council was just formed, my project was to create an evaluation template so that they could gather baseline information and understand if their work is effective by comparing future measurements to their baseline data. I created it by reviewing all the literature written in the region over the last 15 years and compiling all of their recommendations for the future to understand what goals would be most pressing for the Council. The left column has 63 indicators that are intended to be whittled back once the Council has decided on their goals and direction. They are grouped into five headings, demographics and economics, health, local food economy, food access, and food literacy and healthy food tar targets. Across the top, the template compares provincial or regional data to the area's municipalities or electoral areas, which can be compared with the region, within the region as well. Not every indicator will be necessary or secondary information available to measure at all geographic uh, levels. By filling out this template, the Council will be able to identify gaps, weaknesses, and strengths so that they are able to make a proactive approach to collaboratively strengthening our regional food system. I'd like to thank the immense support of my husband and family, my practicum supervisors, Abra Bryn and Megan Squires, and my host agency, the City of Nelson, for their enthusiasm towards developing a healthy regional food system. Finally, I'd like to thank the public health and social policy faculty for sharing your public health enthusiasm with me. It truly is infectious. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, questions for Danielle. Hands up, please, so I can see. Oh, well, I see one over there. Can 
I, I'll, I'll take that one first and then come back to Nigel. Get my exercise. Just wondering on your uh, on your indicators, how much do you account for environmental toxins and micronutrient profiles for nutrition in the population? Um, I think that would be in the health indicators. So it was mainly looking at obesity rates, and I don't have it right in front of me. Um, let's see if I can back up. Yeah, now that you're dizzy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was mainly on the health. It wasn't on in, as much as on the environmental indicators, so that's a good point. That, But I guess that would be often lots of the cancers could be uh, linked to that, so if we were looking specifically more at cancer. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Thanks. Are there other questions as I walk back towards Nigel? Yes. Let's do Hi, I did my practice at Interior Health Authority, so I was just curious to see how, like, if there was collaboration with this, because there would be tie -over Absolutely. Or, like, who exactly you dealt with there, yeah. of where that tied in with the Health Authority? Yeah. So IHA was um, supporting me, um, the healthy communities, and Plan H, um, Carrie Wall. She was sort of one of my um, supervisors, and as well as I paired up with... Um, Katie Hunter, who is a dietitian with IHA in the region, and she's also on the Food Policy Council. So, and she also actually has a master's, so it was really valuable to pair up with her. And so, yeah, they're one of the funding supporters for the Food Pol Policy Council that just formed. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. Okay, now Nigel's turn. Very nice talk, um, Danielle. I, I, I remember saying, and I've said to all the students, you know, try and anticipate questions. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to throw you one which most probably you haven't anticipated. And that's only because I was actually listening to a really interesting interview this morning with a historian, a fellow called Yuval Harari. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's wrote a bestseller uh, called Sapiens. But he describes industrial farming as one of the biggest or worst crimes in history. Um, particularly animal farming. I just wondered philosophically how you feel about um, industrial farming and what alternatives are there? Um, so let me just make sure that I'm going to answer your question correctly. Are you talking more industrial or meat specific? Because I f Well, let's, let's call it meat specific. Yeah. yeah. So the meat specific thing is kind of a challenge because, um, as I said, our entire landscape is centralized now around agriculture. Um, so, so much of our agriculture is is intended to feed the meat that we then eat. So a lot of the energy is lost um, and those are crops that could be used to feed um, hungry people who maybe can't afford expensive sources of protein like meat and that are now um, using it just to feed the meat so that we can eat it. So um, meat is I think widely known by many people in the industry as not a very sustainable way to eat. So. Yeah, I was thinking more along the, uh, Industry? I mean, from a practical point of view, meat is incredibly inefficient. I was yeah. thinking more from an ethical point of view. How do you, how do you see that yourself? Coffee <laughs> 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 yeah. um, And I, I love meat, so. <laughs> so <laughs> you're again talking about meat and not big industry, right? Yes. Ethically, how do I see it? I, f I find it challenging because I really enjoy meat myself. <laughs> Um, but it has definitely stimulated to me to incorporate more vegetarian um, meals into my diet and to start, I feel like I'm, the change is starting to happen where you look at a piece of meat or you taste it and you're starting to turn your body off of it so that you can lose that taste or think to yourself that, it, wow, this tastes good. So I'm myself, I can see the change is starting to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> Thank you for that very difficult and personal question. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, one more. 
Hi, Hi, I'm Carly, and I do food sovereignty research as well. Nice. So I just want to say I really appreciate how you trouble that local and global binary um, and the ethics of that, especially as you're saying that like indigenous food systems can really uh, surpass those local boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering also if there was any consideration of um, migrant farm workers in your evaluation when looking at uh, local foods and local labor. Um, there wasn't so much in the area that I work in. I think in the Kootenays, um, it's more about the small-scale farmers. What's really interesting in the area that I work, uh, that I live in, is that because we're surrounded by so many mountains, the farms themselves are on average of four hectares. So in the in a global scale that is so minuscule. So what you're able to farm in order to make a living is very restricted and you have to make those crops make money for you and that's why people are only making $8,300. So um, migrant workers, I didn't come across that too much in the Central Kootenai region. Thanks for the question though. All right. Thank you, Danielle. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.